Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Dr. Emma Brzezinski and today we're going to be diving into what your supervisor wants you to know. I'm going to be talking to the fantastic Chris Megson, who is Director of Postgraduate Research Education in the School of Performing and Digital Arts at Royal Holloway University of London. Chris has supervised many doctoral students to completion and in 2018 he was shortlisted for the National Times Higher Award for Research Supervisor of the Year so he knows his stuff and in this conversation we get into some really interesting areas thinking about um, that relationship between supervisor and student but also what the supervisor is um, thinking um, as they approach uh, supervision. And we also get into some interesting material around um, finding your own rhythm, time management, and the importance of collaboration. So here is the interview. Chris. Um, Hello. So we know each other so I think that's important to say at the beginning. Um, we do. And I know what a fantastic supervisor you are which is why I wanted to talk to you about this. Um, and that's very, that's very kind Emma and I also think you're a great supervisor as well because we've co-supervised haven't we occasionally? <laughs> we have. We have I, but I think what I really admire about you is that um, you have this real clarity and the ability to kind of really get into things and be really clear about them but you also have that real sort of compassion and um, so that I just think is such a beautiful combination um, and of course this has now been recognised nationally in terms of your um, your National Times higher um nomination so which i am super pleased about um thank you yeah that, that was in i think 2018 yeah i know but it still, it still counts it's still excellent oh, it still counts. <laughs> i hope so <laughs> i'll put um, it on a t-shirt <laughs> so i wanted to pick your brains about um being a supervisor and what that's like and also i think because for phd students there, there can be this real anxiety about that relationship with the supervisor and we know that the relationship with the supervisor can be key for um, completion of things. It's, it really is fundamental. Um, yeah. But before we get into that, I always ask people to talk about their own experience of doing a PhD. Um, so how was that for you? Uh, I did my PhD at the place where I work, where we work, Raw Holloway, um, many moons ago. And I can remember... Um, it certainly took me longer than the three years. And it was at a time, of course, in the 90s when these things were far less regulated in many ways around completion dates and all the rest of it. Um, I do remember distinctly, I, I had a phase right at the end of the process where I locked myself away for three or four months, in fact, and literally mm. wrote the thing. Mm. Um, and I spent an extraordinary amount of time researching. I mean, this is not news to any PhD students, of course, but doing I got so into the archival research I was looking at um uh productions theater productions from um the 1960s and even before that the 1950s and going to the theater museum where the, the the theater archives were based at that point and I got really into the experience of archival research um and uh did loads of research and uh tried my best to continue the writing and practicing the writing and, and all and all that but in fact it was right at the towards the end of the process right at the end of the process that I actually really kind of wrote it in one big chunk and I don't think that's the best way to do it actually um, thinking thinking back uh, on that um, the other thing to say is that I was also working full-time in the latter stages of my PhD I was appointed at Rose Bruford College um, so I had that experience of trying to combine a very demanding first job as an academic in quite a high pressured situation um, with lots of teaching hours and so forth in the closing stages of doing a PhD. So 
I suppose that gave me a, an insight into some of the difficulties of, of balancing work commitments and the demands of a big research project that you're trying to bring into land. Yeah, I think that might be quite a common experience. And I, I think even all the way through now, people working and doing their PhD. Yeah. I wonder if you've got any words of advice then, if there, there are people listening who are right in that just now. Yeah, I think the, the, the most important thing is to keep, a, we'll come back to this, I'm sure, but the most important thing is to keep an open dialogue with the supervisor. I think that's probably the most significant, important message that I want to get across um, today. It's that the more that you can have an open dialogue with your supervisor and talk through any of the difficulties that you're facing or that you expect to face, the sooner you can take action when you're encountering difficulties, the less traumatic the experience will be in negotiating a work, a, a, a working life with um, doing the PhD research and also having, you know, a, a life that's beyond the PhD as well, which is also really important. So um, I, I just think it's really important to try. And obviously, there are things around time management that you can um, practice and you can develop through training. I mean, uh, training is a really important factor, too. Um, I think sometimes when we're looking at a training program that's offered by the institutions in which we're based, we can be very particular about thinking, well, that's not really relevant to my subject area. I'm going to only attend training that is highly specialized in relation to what I want to look at. But the more you can engage with training, it is a kind of discipline and it also encourages a, a receptiveness to ideas. It's a collegial thing. You meet new people and ultimately you can go to things that are around practicing and developing skills in well, broader life skills, actually, like time management, project management, and so forth. And all of those things will help you to develop a, a, a sort of better balance so that you can think, well, what is the time that I've got available in my, my broader working life for the PhD? How can I protect that time? When do I write best, for example? When do I research? When is a good time in the day for reading? When is a good time in the day for writing? Uh, I don't go on about this, but I know from my own experience that I write best between the shockingly um, early hour for many people, I suppose, of sort of 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., 2 p.m. when I can. I mean, that's obviously not really possible during term time always, but I work really well in the mornings and that's when I'm at my most creative. And so in the afternoons, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I can't, you know, I can draft rubbish, but actually it's, um, I'm, I'm better doing kind of administrative things in the afternoon or um, things that are about that don't require too much intellectual labor, let's say. So I think those three things, I think it's about being open with your supervisor, doing lots of training in, in, in broader professional skills, professional develop, development, life skills, keeping an open mind about the training that might just be a benefit to you, even if at first glance it doesn't seem that it, it, it will be. Um, and also being really vigilant about when you, you know, about the time that you've got available and, and, and when it is in the, in the day, the working day, that your best place to do some of the activities that you need to get done, such as writing that thousand words or, or planning that, that, that conference abstract or indeed responding to emails as we all have to do. Uh, so it's, 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 it's being realistic, but also vigilant about, about your own capacities, really. I love that. That's so, oh, such a lot of wisdom in there. And I think it's that whole thing, isn't it, about when we talk about time management, really it's about managing yourself in time rather than managing the time. So it's kind of how how am I going to be in that time? Um, and and it's managing your energy as well, isn't it? If, like you say, if you've got the best energy for writing in the morning, then let that be the time that you do that. And just you, it, Yeah. Yeah, I think, I th uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. And, and for everybody, it's different. Um, people will, 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 some people are morning, I mean, to put it very bluntly, but some people might be morning people, some evening people, some might write their best at, you know, 10 o'clock at night or whatever that's, it, whatever works for you, then it's about trying to find a rhythm, a regular rhythm that you can protect that enables you to do that work. And there isn't to, um, draining of your energies so you know just just be aware of that um, and also I think I mean this is something that is true of any large-scale project but it, it's about seeing the the enterprise not as a I remember my supervisor who was a fantastic academic and, and um, 
scholar called David Bradby, he would he would sort of say to me, you know, Chris, it's not a, a magnus opus, a PhD. Um, it might feel like that. So in other words, a big, big, the most important thing you'll ever write. Um, he, you know, he was very clear that actually it's a, it's a project that is benchmarked. It's about meeting certain thresholds and criteria. It's kind of a big essay um, that, uh, that, that has its own kind of um, assessment criteria attached to it and that are visible and transparent that you can read. And so seeing it in those terms, um, it, it may just demystify it slightly and, and help you to think, well, you know, what's the best way I can start with this project or what, what, what can I usefully do given the limited time I've got this afternoon or this e early evening or, or what have you? What's the what, how can I make m the most productive use of this short amount of time to, to enable me to just move one step or half step forward? So it's breaking it down in that way um, and, and really just trying not to see it as this terribly um, uh, overwhelmingly significant project that is, is going to um, capsize you really with, with its um, stature and, and all the rest of it. We can easily be intimidated by the project that we've set ourselves with a PhD, but I think, you know, break it down and, and, and recognize that it's, um, it's a big essay and you need to kind of uh, approach it with, with, with that more combative attitude and, and you'll get there. Well, I love that. And I, I think that's good supervision, isn't it? And David Bradbury obviously was fantastic, but kind of giving perspective on the project. Because I think as you, when you go yeah, into the yeah. PhD, you can very easily lose perspective and your supervisor can be there to kind of give that perspective. Um, so then in terms of perspective, do you see what I did there? I've just segued into something very smooth. Um, but I think there's lots of... Um, projections on from PhD students of kind of what supervisors want and what they're interested in and what they what they are about what they expect of their students so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what what you um love about being a supervisor the joys and the challenges of being a supervisor so we we can kind of get that from the supervisor's perspective yeah I think um yeah, I, I mean, for me uh, and for many of the colleagues that I, 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 I know, PhD supervision is one of the, if not the most rewarding um, activity aspect of being an academic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, that, it's that important to us. Um, it's, it's extraordinarily fulfilling. And, and in part, it's fulfilling because of the challenges, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But, but it's it's incredibly rewarding to see a student develop a project, gain in confidence, acquire skills of project management and leadership, begin to develop a public profile for their work, uh, submit a PhD, respond to whatever challenges emerge throughout that process, including possibly the outcome of that viva where it may not be quite what you want or what have you. And then if, if that's the case, then to, to build resilience and to submit um, corrections and, and, and finally emerge with, with a PhD. Uh, and in some of the supervisees that I've um, uh, supervised in the past, go on to publish books and, and to get, you know, uh, employed in universities and, and build careers which are fantastic for me and as i say for many of my uh, colleagues it is the, the one of the most uh, rewarding aspects of, of being in the job um and uh, if not the most rewarding aspects it's so unlike, exciting isn't it to be working really exciting, alongside someone yeah. yeah it's really exciting and we really value it and it's not a case of it's not a, a kind of cross that we have to bear or a burden on our backs it's it's one of the main reasons we're in the job so we want to engage we want to uh, be, be part of it we've looked you know we've, we've accepted your application because it really excites us and um and it's really important to remember that because i think sometimes supervisees feel that they're encroaching on the time of the supervisor or that the supervisor is um it, it has some kind of reservations yeah, about their abilities really, yeah that could be and really those common they can be very um, debilitating. I, I, I think the challenges um, are, are not unexpected, really. I think the, the, the challenges occur usually when students fall silent. And they often fall silent um, because they're, they're embarrassed about work that they haven't been able to do, or they've got life circumstances that have erupted um, and prevented them from progressing as they would have hoped. 
Um, and in the course of three or four years, it's important to remember that in the life of your supervisor, <laughs> in, and in fact, in anybody's life, things are going to erupt and, and cause a bit of consternation and trouble um, and delay our progress. So that's not in itself any reason to feel that you, you, know, you can't be open about that with your, with your supervisory team. Mm -hmm. So some of the challenges emerge from, or the primary challenge in, in my experience is the kind of head ostrich challenge, the head in the sand <laughs> challenge, yes. um, and, and which is why I started by saying I think the most important thing is even if it feels incredibly difficult and um, uh, unnerving and exposing to, to write that email or to have that talk in your supervisory session about what is actually going on, it's really important to do that because then we can properly support you and, and give you the encouragement, the practical advice and the guidance that you need to get over the obstacle. And in the course of a PhD, just as in wider life, in the course of anything that you're doing that's significant, obstacles almost inevitably, almost by definition will arise. Mm. So in a, in a sense, expect them. Mm. Um, and and don't and and you know when they when they happen it's a it's a it's a kind of symbol that you're moving forward because you never move forward on something that really matters without facing obstacles so mm. you know treat them with that kind of spirit get get support from your supervisor and also actually um I think the biggest resource, you know, there are books and so on that one can read and training that one, one can do, as I was, was indicating earlier. But actually a big resource, the biggest resource, aside from your supervisory team, is other, other PhD students. So this is why training matters too. It's not just about acquiring the knowledge and skills. It's about building relationships with people. I mean, PhDs are collegial. Mm. Um, they might seem as if it's one person slogging away, but actually they shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. There, it's a kind of collegial enterprise. It involves supervisors. It involves other PhD students supporting you and you supporting them. So the more you can engage in building those relationships with others, the more in the long term those relationships you can activate in times of difficulty and you can support others too mm -hmm. um i think so, there's that sense oh sorry i think yeah. there's this sense no, of no, kind no, of being it. work colleagues and it's it's kind of taking that different step isn't it moving from being that undergraduate student where you might want to always put your best self forward and be the be the top student now you're in a, a place of, of kind of working together and acknowledging um the what's what's coming up along the way because that's like as you say that's part of the process yeah, and I think it's it is actually a professional dynamic, isn't it? Yeah, what I mean yeah. by that is that it's it's not um, as you say, it's not so much an undergraduate issue in that sense. It's more a case of right, I'm coming into a, it's it's that very historic sense of a PhD, which is a kind of professional training, a, prof a training to go to to kind of go into the academy. So actually, at the granular level, asking for support is a is a professional practice. Yeah, it sh it shouldn't be seen as a kind of um, weakness in a human being. It, it absolutely isn't. It's a kind of it's a, it's a professional practice is what we should be doing mm. Um, mm. because in in that activity of asking for support when we're in difficulty or where we don't have the skills or knowledge then then actually that becomes a way of of of, of um building relationships and uh being becoming part of a community um becoming part of the academy in this instance absolutely and i think that sense of as you've made really clear of your supervisor will welcome that We'll welcome that. Um, so do not be afraid of stepping forward and going, actually, this is a real challenge or this is this is um, what's going on for me. Because this is, yeah, it's a long-term relationship and things will happen. Yeah. And the supervisor can, I mean, if, if the problems are to do with... Um... Uh, it could be various things, then the supervisor can refer you to appropriately trained experts inside the institution that you're studying in, uh, whether that's to do with finances or um, uh, educational tra training of various kinds, or it might be to do with counselling. Um, so uh, they can refer you on. I think the, the real challenge um, r tends to be when... Um, the, you know students do fall silent as i was saying and also mm. that can cause real issues around suddenly work might appear just occasionally I, i've had phd students submit you know quite a lot of work without any pronouncement or any forward warning and and obviously to read twenty five thousand words in the middle of or the start of term without any kind of um forewarning can be difficult so i think it's just really important to have a sense 
the, the supervisory contact when you have those meetings. Obviously, it's about a discussion of the research, of the content of your thinking, of your argumentation, um, of your uh, uh, prog the progression of the project but it's also about keeping that eye on the future so mm. okay what's next are we both ready to set a deadline where we can check in about this or a deadline for submission of the work that works for us both and also works for the broader institutional timeline around annual reviews and completion of work to to certain deadlines and, and ultimately the the, the, the the submission deadline itself so that's also part of what it means to be communicating openly. It's about your supervisor also saying, look, I've got a really busy time coming up. So um, why don't we think about a deadline that, that accommodates us both in this instance? Um, so it works both ways. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think also that sense of um, it's it's OK to look beyond your supervisor, too, isn't it? That sense of that. Um, that as you said, there may be other support services, there may be other resources, there may be other people. And when your supervisor's referring you on to that, that's because it, it will be helpful to you. It's not because the supervisor's trying to get rid of you. It's because that, they can see that that's helpful to you. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think one of the most important things that a supervisor would want their students to understand from the outset is... Um, and, and it's easy to take this the wrong way because of what I was saying earlier, but, but academics are just hugely busy and under pressure of um, supervising and teaching undergraduates, postgraduate taught students and other PhD students too, uh, alongside a, a daily avalanche of email connected to research activities, teaching activities, and you know, significantly so administrative ac activities that they're involved in. So of course they're busy people. Um, and I, that what I wouldn't want that to translate as in the ears of your listeners is they're too busy or not you know that they're, they're, they're distracted with so many other things that they've got no time for me it absolutely doesn't mean that no. all it means is um you know let's be organized let's be clear about when we're next meeting let's set deadlines even if they're check-in deadlines rather than deadlines about the formal submission of drafts or what have you and if they need revising if i'm anticipating a busy crunch period coming up that i wasn't aware of when we had that supervisory meeting let me drop an email to my supervisor and, and try and you know flag that so that we're both aware of it mm. it's, it's mm. about that clarity of mm. keeping the channels of communication just clear so that both both the supervisory team um and the the student the supervisee can 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 move forward with that confidence and and hopefully with a sense of it's okay when difficulties arise because i've talked them through i love it i love it so that sense of really coming into a professional relationship having a sense of your own working with them and then thinking about the working rhythm of your supervisor and so starting to develop that um collaborative working method which is going to be so useful for you as you go if you, you go further into an academic career or even into um a corporate role i think that that that, that learning isn't it of the phd is is be, is about yourself as well as about your subject yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's a really helpful mindset to start out a PhD by thinking, I want to make this as as, as collaborative as possible. Mm, mm, mm. And that will affect everything from how I engage with my supervisory team or my, my lead supervisor to how I'm going to, you know, the kind of um, disposition that I'm going to bring to invitations to training. I'm going to take advantage of those to how you get involved in your department or your school or your faculty um, to, to build connections and, and participate in the research or postgraduate community. Um, and depending on your subject, how you can then build external links with, you know, what conferences are, are really useful for me to go to? Um, how can I get involved in, in the wider field outside the institution? Uh, so I think it's tempting when you start a PhD to think, um, in some cases, by no means all, absolutely not. But in a lot of cases, even today, uh, it, it's possible to think, well, this is right. I'm going into my room and I'll see you in three and a half years or four years. Mm, mm. Um, and actually, I think the good, the best mindset is to think, you know, how can I collaborate? How can I build a community around this project? Um, because that is going to be really important going forward because it will give you support, uh, fresh ideas, critique, 
um, a sense of confidence and ultimately connections that could you know build a really really important momentum for a future a future career that's great and of course we're talking more from arts and humanities and we will have people talking about from from science who perhaps are a bit ahead of the game ironically in terms of collaboration but this is becoming more and more important and kind of strategically isn't it we know if you're if you're thinking of developing grant applications and things collaboration is just such an important skill so chris there's so much wisdom in there in terms of of kind of how to approach the PhD and what what's going on in the supervisor's mind. I'm just going to ask you an impossible question because I do that at the end of every interview. But just to finish with a kind of a, a, a top tip, if you if you had to have one piece of advice to give to people, um, what would that be in terms of their relationship with their supervisor? And it could be just reiterating what you've already said. That's okay. I'll let you. I'll let you get away with that. It reminds me of the the Radio Four program Desert Island Disc. Exactly. Where you can only play one item to the um, exactly. The, the Desert Island. Um, if I have a, a sort of takeaway, um, a takeaway piece of advice, I suppose it, it would be um, avoid the ostrich syn- syndrome. Mm. Even when it feels really difficult, try and keep your head out of the sand and keep an open dialogue with your supervisor about things that are coming up. So, so, so useful. And I think really, really important. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that was awesome. And there will be further reading and links in um, the show notes for people. Thank you so much. And um, we will speak to you next time.